Hi, this is Mr. Cocker. Um, I thought I would just run through a quick whistle-stop tour of some of the key points for Anglo-Saxon Norman England uh, for the Edexcel specification. Um, the aim is to kind of give you a little lecture um, that covers most of the key areas. There are some obvious things that I've missed out, they're just things that are done so well um, in other videos. Um, but I thought I'd give you a nice overview, uh, 1066 to 1088. If you're taking notes along with this video, um, it's just a nice kind of handout um, we've got here. Just breaks down the, the four key areas, Anglo-Saxon England, then the Norman invasion, William in power, and then life in Norman England. And we've got space for those key events and features and another space for any causes of change, anything that's particularly important. It's just quite a nice way of kind of structuring your notes as you go through. Anyway, we'll dive straight in. So life in England before the Norman Conquest. So Edward the Confessor was not in a very strong position as king. Um, he had been brought back um, as king by Godwin in 1042. That's Earl Godwin after a period of Danish rule. There have been a couple of rulers. Um, so this is a brief kind of chronology. So we've got Ethelred the Unready, Ethelred Unared, uh, who was a Saxon, um, and the closest kind of linked Edward the Confessor. But then we have Canute. Uh, and Hartha Canute, um, who are nominally both kings of England, before we get to Edward the Confessor. So he's been brought back after this period of Danish rule. Um, and Edward the Confessor was entirely dependent on the Godwin family for his power. Uh, he had agreed to marry Godwin's daughter, Edith, in return for Godwin's help becoming king. Um, so he was already sort of owed quite a lot to Godwin. Uh, the Godwin, Godwin family also controlled pretty much every major earldom in the kingdom, with the exception of Mercia, which sits kind of in the middle, um, pretty much everything else. Um, and Edward does try and kind of rid himself of, of, of Godwin. So it shows that there is this tension between them. Uh, Godwin was exiled. Uh, the whole family, in fact, were exiled in 1050. Um, and they may well have asked friends in Normandy there uh, to help them. Uh, in doing this or to help Edward in, in kind of pushing them out. It's maybe where um, William, Duke of Normandy, gets the idea that maybe he's going to be king next from. Um, but unfortunately, when Godwin arrives at the head of a massive army a year later, Edward um, decides to pardon Godwin rather than risking a civil war. So in the end, Godwin calls Edward's bluff um, and just returns at the head of a massive army. Uh, and Edward has no choice but to reinstate him as Earl. And England is still quite a divided kingdom. In theory, Edward the Confessor controlled everything from Hadrian's Wall uh, to the Channel. Uh, but there are regional differences between the north and the south, particularly we'll see this uh, in the kind of functions of the Dane law. Um, they meant the south of England functioned um, very much as, as kind of Edward's kingdom and the north um, kind of followed its own sets of rules and customs and then really focused around having powerful northern earls uh, who took control of those areas. Um, and the Danish invasions had led to the Anglo-Saxons building these large burrs, these large fortified towns, um, and they become very, very important um, to the Anglo-Saxons, particularly because they are still in danger of Danish invasion. And we see that um, in, uh, with the Norman conquest and even uh, during William's time as king, we see these uh, invasions coming in from the north and if you see um, the burrs you see they sit pretty much all around Wessex this area in the north we don't really see any burrs and that shows you that actually Edward's power is still quite limited so why would Godwin so powerful can we break that down well by 1060 the house of Godwin not a real house we're talking about the family had come to dominate Anglo-Saxon politics uh, they built a power base in Wessex which is where Earl Godwin was uh, Earl. And when he dies, as you see, uh, his eldest child, Harold Godwinson, takes over Wessex. Um, Mercia is their only area where there is some weakness. But we see Tostig Godwinson, Earl of Northumbria, until the revolt that ousts him from power. Uh, Grith Godwinson in East Anglia. Leofwine Godwinson um, in the area, I suppose it's around kind of Essex and, and I suppose up towards Cambridge. And then Harold Godwinson, Earl of Wessex. We can see the, that by the time he gets 1060, all this power um, is in place. And you've just got this power, this Mercian kingdom that sits in the middle that's potentially a bit of a threat. So that's why the Godwins are so powerful. They're massive landowners and they have um, huge control over the Witan, which is going to be the king's closest advisors. And it's usually made up of earls and bishops 
you can see that is so many um, of the earls of England are members of the Godwin family. You can imagine they had quite a significant say. Harold Godwinson does also go one step further. Um, there are three political marriages, um, three Ediths and a Judith, so I suppose four political marriages. Um, so the House of Godwin increases its power and influence in several ways. One, uh, Earl Godwin's daughter, Edith, marries King Edward. So in theory, you know, the next heir to the throne will be um, Edith's daughter, will be Go uh, Godwin's grandchild, it will be Harold Godwinson's uh, nephew. So that's how the, that's the initial plan to kind of marry in and get power in that way. Harold Godwinson also had a political marriage uh, to Edith of Mercia, daughter of Alfgar, and then a second marriage to Edith the Fair, uh, who had influence in East Anglia. So these two marriages uh, give um, give Godwin quite significant power over East Anglia, and then Mercia, that powerful kingdom that isn't directly controlled by the Godwins. Um, and then Tosti Godwinson marries Judith. Um, he was the daughter of Baldwin of Flanders, and you can see getting international connections here to make sure that your neighbours don't interfere if there is any conflict. Um, we've talked briefly about Godwin being in trouble, um, and we talked about Edward being in exile in Normandy, um, but I think it's really important if we're going to think about why the Godwins had so much power, then our political marriages and the where they sit um, in terms of like uh, control of England are probably the most important too. I suppose our final one is the is the embassy to Normandy. Um, Harold certainly uh, was trusted and probably Edward's most trusted advisor. He'd acted acted as a, a kind of sub king for him and as, and as commander of his armies. Um, and when he's sent to Normandy in 1064, I think Harold hopes this is going to kind of solidify his power as, as the future king. Um, the things that we know for definite is that Edward sent Harold to Normandy in 1064 or 1065 with a message. We don't know what that message was. We know that Harold was shipwrecked and taken prisoner by Guy of Ponthieu, but that William rescued him. That's William, Duke of Normandy, rescues him. Harold fought for William and William gave him gifts of weapons and armour. That may well have been because he was shipwrecked and he'd lost everything. Or it may well be that Harold was submitting to William's power. And that, that really depends on the different interpretations. Um, and that Harold swore an oath as part of his embassy. But we don't know what that oath was. It's immortalised here in the Bayeux Tapestry. But remember, this was made by um, Odo Bishop of Bayer, or for Odo Bishop of Bayer, I should say. It was made by um, a sea, a, probably a huge team of seamstresses based probably in Kent um, after the Norman Conquest, but it was made for Odo Bishop of Bayer, and it continues showing Harold making this great promise. The Normans say that Harold swore allegiance to William and recognised William as the future king, um, whereas the Anglo-Saxons say the embassy was to recover two hostages, uh, who had been held to protect Edward from Godwin. But, uh, but Godwin was dead by this point. Edward probably didn't have very much life left by this point. And so it would make sense to go and collect those hostages. And it would make sense for those hostages to be member of the Godwin, to be members of the Godwin family, and therefore a member, the senior member of the household um, or senior member of the family, which would be Harold, to go and get them. So both of these um, interpretations stand up. We'll probably never know which one was correct. Um, but they are our two interpretations. And this should solidify their power, um, but potentially undermines it, uh, undermines it. And then the second one that definitely undermines the Godwin's power is the rising against Earl Tosti. So uh, when Seward, uh, Seward the Bear, Earl of Northumbria, died in 1055, his oldest living son, that's Waltheof, uh, we'll see him in the Rebellion of the Earls later in this lecture, uh, was only five. Tostig um, was therefore put in as Earl. He made an important political marriage to Judith of Flanders, which is an important trading ally. Um, and therefore, he was in a good position to demand that he be made Earl of Northumbria. However, Tostig went too far. There were harsh new taxes, uh, laws, political assassinations that led to a rebellion against Tostig in 1065. Harold could have stopped this, but he didn't. And we, we can probably only guess as to why. Um, Harold knew that Edward was uh, not going to live very much longer and that Tostig, he thought, was probably his next biggest rival for power. Um, with this powerful political marriage to Judith of Flanders and control in theory of pretty much the whole north of England, uh, Tostig could have made some kind of power play for the throne. Um, 
Harold would have needed the support of the Witan if he was to become king, and the rebellion against Tostig was a chance to gain support from Earls Edwin and Morcar. Um, Edwin and Morcar, um, Earls um, based in Mercia. Um, Edwin is Earl of Mercia, and it gives Morcar the opportunity to be promoted to become Earl of Northumbria. So his two, Harold's two brother-in-laws, sit on the Witan, probably on the understanding that when the time comes, they will vote uh, for Harold as next king. And remember, at this point, the Witan choose the next king. The king chooses who is on the Witan. The king chooses whether he listens to their advice or not. The king chooses how often the Witan meet, but the Witan choose the next king. So Harold is hoping that he can gain control of the Witan, get unanimously voted into power, which in fairness, when Edward the Confessor dies, is pretty much exactly what happens. Um, and the events that kind of follow that lead, obviously, to the succession crisis. Now, I, there are so many videos on the succession crisis and on all the single aspects of it. Uh, the BBC ones are probably the best, but there are loads and loads out there. So I'm not going to devote a lot of time to that. There are a few key points, though. It could be argued, if you're going for a grade nine, there was no succession crisis. The Witan chose Harold Gobinson, the end of it. That is how the king was appointed in Anglo-Saxon England. And if you had an, an essay question or a 16 mark question on this and you really wanted to show off how well you understood this period, it would be worth noting that, that there are academics who argue there was no succession crisis at all. There is just a Norman conquest and actually invasion um, after Harold's succession to the throne. Um, and that when William kills Harold, um, there is then a succession crisis about who should be king next. Um, so, yeah, that, that's but that's really going for grade nine kind of material. Um, from the Norman point of view, the Normans would say the Norman conquest isn't a conquest at all. If the Norman version of Harold's embassy to Normandy is in fact true, then William is simply succeeding to a throne. He's not conquering England. So just a couple of kind of grade nine points there um, if you wanted to show off. And um, just a few things about the Battle of Hastings. Obviously, we've got our, our key battles. First one at Fulford Gate, 20th of September. And Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September, and then that long march south um, to Hastings. Um, so we've got our, our kind of key battles in there. And I've just put up on the screen, you could pause it and take notes if you wanted, kind of the reasons for William's victory. Remember, in a 16 mark question, you're going to have to offer um, three reasons. I would probably do um, William's leadership and tactics, um, and uh, Harold's leadership and tactics, and then the element of luck as my third one. So I take those top two, make them one paragraph, bottom two, one paragraph, and take luck as a separate shorter point um, as the three kind of primary reasons uh, for the Anglo-Saxon defeat or for William's victory. Anyway, after the Norman invasion, we then move on and think about how William consolidates his power. Uh, and he does this in several ways. Uh, first of all, he sits and waits uh, at Hastings, thinking that the Witan will come and surrender to him, uh, perhaps slightly naive, but that is his plan. Um, when this is apparently not going to happen, uh, William goes for his backup, which is to march to Dover and take control of the fortress there. It's while he's in Dover that his men become very sick with dysentery. Um, and even when they recover, uh, they could not break through London's high stone walls, the walls that the Romans essentially had built and the Anglo-Saxons had fortified. Um, so... He ha is forced, forced to basically march round underneath um, in um, London, goes to Wallingford, where he manages to seize the royal treasury, um, and then to Burke Hampstead and gets the submission of the earls. So there are a few key points here. One, Edgar the Atheling was the Witan's next choice, uh, but he was too young to act decisively. Um, he should have gone to Dover while the Normans were sick, uh, burnt the fortress to the ground and killed everyone. Um, but he, there, there's, you can imagine that there were lots of different earls giving him advice and refusing to follow him. He wasn't tested in battle. So essentially, the Anglo-Saxons kind of lose their bottle without um, Harold Gobinson there to kind of steady the ship. They, they, they kind of go in all different directions. And we see this in the same way when, when William dies um, in 1087 and 1088. Um, there's this kind of chaotic... Um, transition where people kind of panic they run back they lock themselves in their burrs or for the normans in their castles and just kind of hope to ride things out our second key advantage is that william seizes the royal treasury at wallingford edgar the atheling uh, had therefore little to offer his followers or to hire any mercenaries to create any kind of battle force um, to 
match the Normans. So William manages to steal a march, get to the treasury, and he becomes the wealthiest man in England, even if he is not the choice of the Witan. So once the earls submit, and we don't know exactly who, we know that Edgar the Atheling submits, um, that Edwin and Morcar are probably there and they submit, um, but we don't have an, an exclusive list. The idea is that this submission of the earls opens up London um, to William, and from there William can be crowned king on Christmas Day of 1066. And William has three kind of key aims. One, reward his followers. He needs to send lavish gifts to the Pope. Remember, the Pope sent William a papal banner to show his support, to show that God was on William's side. Um, he sets a heavy gale tax to pay his mercenaries, and he says that all land belongs to the king. I think that's probably hidden by the time. Um, but this is obviously the beginning of the feudal system, um, a brand new concept. William was not the owner of all land in Normandy, nor had any of the Anglo-Saxon kings been the owners of all land. But William invents this concept, making himself the only uh, primary landowner um, and obviously giving him a huge amount of power. The next one is take control of the borders, um, creation of the March Earldoms, which create essentially a Norman colony in England. Um, we could try and encourage immigration from Normandy to England um, and building castles along the Sussex coast. And you can see um, this is the area we're talking about, which provides an escape route should things go kind of badly wrong uh, in England. And then subdue the population and be crowned king. There's a huge castle building campaign, starts using peasants as slave labour. This is one of the reasons um, we get suggested why there was rebellions against William. So they don't like the castle building. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, and then obviously he's crowned king. That would be a nice, simple story, but obviously there's a series of Anglo-Saxon resistance. There's actually a Welsh resistance first in 1067, the uh, rebellion of Yadric the Wild, which further adds evidence to the idea that William was right to build the March Earldoms. They do um, successfully prevent um, any kind of Welsh invasion um, that might stir up troubles in, in the Anglo-Saxon population. Um, but we tend to focus more on the key areas for Anglo-Saxon resistance. And you can see just linked to my previous point, castles were resented as being a symbol of Norman domination. Um, housing was cleared to build the castles. People's homes were torn down. People were forced to provide resources for the castle garrisons, like food, water, as well as actually building the huge man-made hills, these motts that the castles sit on. That was all done by the Anglo-Saxons. And it definitely does stir up resistance, but there are other factors that drive resistance too. And I would argue that castle building probably isn't the main um, the main kind of cause. My argument would actually be that bad government is the main cause. It was reported that Odo uh, of Bayeux, William Fitzosborne, had seized land unlawfully, so these illegal land grabs, and allowed, allowed their soldiers to rape Anglo-Saxon women without punishment. Um, and this is after William has been crowned king. And there'll be lots and lots of Anglo-Saxons who feel this way. And we see this kind of run through the rebellions that happen after 1068. Um, even the rebellion of Heriwood Her the Wake, which sits right at the end of the Anglo-Saxon rebellion period. What really stirs Heriwood to action, at least as far as the legend goes, is um, the murder of his brothers and the Normans kind of laughing and joking um, about uh, the, Ang the English population. Those things drive Heriwood the Wake. Um, Edwin and Morcar certainly kind of feel unhappy. Um, William was uh, meant to ensure that Edwin married his daughter, but then William goes back on his word. Um, so Edwin feels some resentment. Uh, Morcar is unhappy because his earldom was reduced in size. Um, so um, he feels um, like he's been cheated. Edwin's been cheated. And they, obviously they lead these rebellions. But I think for a lot of people, it was the, the bad government the heavy geld tax um, in December of 1066, which then pretty much is all packed up and taken across the channel to Normandy in the spring of 1067. Um, and this huge loss of English tre treasure would have made lots of the Anglo-Saxon earls and um, previous landowners and important people feel that William was just kind of planning to take their money. So the bad government, the heavy taxes and the loss of land um, would be my three favourite causes of revolt. The loss of land, um, Odo and William, obviously, these illegal land grabs, um, bad government, which again centres around Odo and William Fitzosborne, and then this heavy gale tax. So obviously all of these factors um, do play a significant part. So a quick run through then of the rebellions themselves. So Edwin and Morcar's rebellion goes first in 1068. 
Um, but it's pretty short lived. Um, William marches north, building castles in Warwick and Nottingham. That is not where the rebels are. They are the homes of Edwin and Morcar, I suppose. Um, so the rebels realise that William has taken control of the areas where their families are um, and they very quickly surrender. Uh, William appoints a, a Norman um, who becomes Earl of Northumbria and he obviously plays an important part um, later on. It's always difficult. I presume we're calling him Robert Cumin, but it doesn't really matter. You're only going to write it in the exam. Um, and then January 1069, that very same person, um, Robert Cumin, made Earl of Northumbria. Um, he um, sends his men out looting and murdering um, on his way um, north. Um, it's trying to show strength, but in fact, it just makes the population very, very angry. He is then murdered um, because the Anglo-Saxons essentially resist. They didn't really like having Tostig as a as the Earl of Northumbria. They were used to having a Northumbrian Earl, so they reject their Norm new Norman Earl. Um, and we see then in February, um, so a month after um, the, uh, Robert Cumin's death, they have an uprising in York. Um, Edgar the Atheling obviously comes down from Scotland to kind of capitalise on this opportunity. Um, and what does William do? He's forced to race north. He destroys York and he builds new castles there. So these symbols of power. Um, and we see that castle building is important in 1068 and it's important again in 1069. Um, there are some other factors, though, going on by the end of 1069. So a Danish invasion fleet has joined up with Edgar's forces and attacked York. There's uh, new rebellions beginning in the north, but also in Devon, down in the southwest, Shrewsbury on the March Earldoms, Chester, another March Earldom. The Danish fleet is able to hide in the marshes, and that's no good for William. He can't build castles there because the ground is simply too wet and soft. Um, so William begins the process of harrying the north, um, and he also uses his vast wealth to pay off the Danes. Now, it's a bit of a gamble paying off the Danes, because if you pay them off, they will come back and they'll ask for more money. They'll go away and they'll take the money and they'll come back in a year or two and they'll demand more money. Um, so William is playing a dangerous game here, paying off the Danes, but it buys him some time. And we see this, the Danes return literally a year later um, and they set up a base this time in Ely. They don't settle in the north. The harrying of the north has meant there is nothing there for them. So they're forced to set up in East Anglia. Uh, in Ely, which is um, basically a hill in the bow of a river um, surrounded by marshland on every side. So it's perfect for their boats. They can glide in. They can um, put their boats on the safe side of the, the Ely side of the river um, and not worry about them being burnt, uh, which is a great fear of the Danes that their boats will be burnt and they'll be trapped. Um, so it seems like it's gone really badly, badly for William that paying off the Danes was a mistake. Um, Hereward the Wake joins them. And again, his main argument is, is with bad government. He's unhappy about the way that the, the Anglo-Saxons have been treated. Uh, Morcar and his men join Hereward. So all of uh, William's enemies mass are massing against him and also somewhere he can't build castles. Um, the rebels control of Ely, which is basically an island, um, means that they're the only people who've got any kind of raised fortification. Um, but essentially local monks eventually do show William and his troops a safe way through the marches. And at this point, Anglo-Saxon rebellions end. We don't know whether the monks um, or what motivated them, whether he bribed them, which is what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says, or whether, in fact, by this point, um, they've accepted that William is appointed by God. Lanfranc's reforms of the church have meant that actually there's a lot of support for William as king um, and maybe they, they wanted to help him. Uh, but at this point, we know Anglo-Saxon rebellion ends. Um, we know that Anglo-Saxons also helped William fight the rebels, which is quite an important change. It's the first time we see that. And that kind of leads us into this question, why then would the Anglo-Saxon rebellions aim, uh, end? Anglo-Saxon rebellions end. And there are, there are quite a few reasons. Some of them relate to William um, and his role as king um, and others uh, to some of the other things that are going on. So I'll quickly read through them. So we've got a uh, claim to the throne. Norman propaganda stressed that William had been Edward's rightful successor as well as his relative. So there are Anglo-Saxons at this point thinking, well, you know, maybe he is the rightful king. The royal ceremonies. Uh, William had begun new ceremonies of being seen wearing his crown three times a year. Um, this also um, when he consulted with the Witan. So you can see William attempting to be a, a quite a modern and effective king. Uh, the coinage. Uh, William's coins featured his image, reinforcing his role as king. 
uh, writs, they're like legal documents. Uh, William's image also appeared on the royal seal of his writs. William used these writs to issue his orders across the land. The Anglo-Saxon writ system was designed to maintain royal power across England, and William used writs enthusiastically, so he's really getting hold of some of the things that other Anglo-Saxon kings um, have used very effectively, and he's, he's taking hold of those and making them his own. Uh, oath-taking, William held oath-taking ceremonies in which landholders swore their allegiance to William as their king. Obviously, breaking that oath meant you lo- lost your land. If you lost your land, you pretty much lost all your power. Um, and William travelled vastly around England. Different parts of the kingdom showed himself as king to his subjects. He could also show favour to important subjects by visiting them and holding talks. So he was he was actually acting as a very efficient king. And that is one very, very important factor for why Anglo-Saxon rebellions end. Uh, William's also shown himself to be a phenomenal warrior. So again, if you were having this as a 16 marker, I take a few of these points as one um, of your paragraphs. Now I'd probably pick two more of these. Uh, William's military strength, the Anglo-Saxons respected great warrior kings. However, such kings would ideally also show wisdom in their lawmaking and mercy in their treatment of their subjects. So Edward the Confessor was respected uh, for living on the revenues of his own estates rather than benefiting from the frequent geld taxes, whereas William was taking all that money with him. Religious influence, though, William had control over the appointments to senior positions in the church. Um, his reforms, Lamb Frank's reforms, really, of the church in England increased Norman control of the messages that were given out. Um, and they also used to praise William as, as being a very, very effective king. And our last one, which I think is probably very, very important, which is land ownership. William was able to use forfeited Anglo-Saxon lands to reward his followers, slowly getting rid of those people who aren't loyal to him and bringing in people who are going to be very loyal. This helped ensure their support uh, for William's rule um, as England's king. Uh, Challenges to William's rule uh, came from those who um, disagreed or had not been given enough land. So we can see land ownership being really quite important for William's rule. Um, the, obviously, William does face one other revolt, but this time from his own um, his own side, essentially from from Norman earls. Um, and this this revolt, the revolt of the earls, is, is pretty short lived. After Waltheof informs Lamb Frank about the revolt, um, Lamb Frank um, is able to harness um, the essentially other members of the clergy, so Bishop Wolfstan, uh, the Abbot of Evesham, um, and excommunicate Roger. Um, and that this means that there really isn't any major threat in the revolt of the earls. And, and William doesn't isn't even in the kingdom. He doesn't have to deal with it. Actually, we can see that the growing power of the church um, and the growing power of Lamb Frank um, in England is actually really important in preventing rebellion. So even we go back, think about that religious influence. And students often overlook that um, as a factor. But when we look at the revolt of the earls, it's, it's probably one of the key factors that ends the rebellion. Obviously, we've got other legal ways that or other illegal means that, that look at land holding. Doomsday Book is a great example of this. It's got really four purposes. So financial, it meant that William could see how much landholders were paying. It's also legal implications. It, it kind of makes sure land is distributed fairly. It kind of prevents or challenges some of the land grabs that uh, were criticisms of Norman rule. And again, we see that. You know, William is acting to try and prevent rebellion. Doomsday Book is a good way of acknowledging that, yes, illegal land grabs, bad government in the early years of the Norman Conquest were something that had caused rebellion. And they were something that William worked quite hard to try and remove or to get rid of. Doomsday Book is an evidence of that. Um, And then military as well. um, The idea that um, it meant that William could um, very quickly ascertain how many knights um, he could have for service, how many nights his tenants could actually um, afford so that he was always kind of fully stocked uh, with an army. And remember, night service is one of the key changes uh, that the Normans bring in um, as part of feudalism. And it means that William has always got a highly trained army. The Anglo-Saxon kings had an army, the feared, uh, but the feared was an army of peasants, uh, whereas the Normans, they, with the process of night service, they have a highly trained army all of the time. Um, so there's a few comparisons here. So in the way that society had changed, obviously, um, Norman thought slavery was wrong. They freed some, but not all of their slaves. So the slave population as a percentage decreases. Uh, the peasants, these churls, who'd made up about 90% of the population, some of whom were free, they're all bound to their lords. 
Um, so life for the peasants gets much worse in Norman society. Uh, the thane class, probably the most significant change, there are about four to 6,000 thanes. And they each owned about five hides of land and gave military service. But the thanes are wiped out as a landowning class and they're replaced by knights who are essentially vassals to tenants in chief. So they're people who give up their military service in return for land. They don't own any land. They exchange land for military service. Um, and obviously our earls, our Anglo-Saxon earls, were very powerful and very wealthy. They posed a threat to the king. Whereas the earls um, were largely replaced by Normans, earldoms were much smaller, where earls held multiple um, lands or multiple earldoms. They were spread out. They were a long way away from each other. So they couldn't, they'd have to march their soldiers across other earls' lands to, to stage any kind of rebellion. Often um, we see Odo and William Fitzosburne, the people that William should trust the most, to join their earldoms up. They have to cross the king's own land, the king's domain. Um, and that means that nobody gets to move around England without the king knowing about it. So um, those things essentially help consolidate William's power. Um, and they're just a nice example of how feudalism and landholding um, kind of fundamentally changed the Anglo-Saxon um, society to one that we recognise more as a Norman society. Um, there are lots of things that, that stayed the same, though. Farming life very much went on as before. Um, although William replaced um, the Anglo-Saxons with Normans, the actual government, the actual process of government, the writs, um, the Witan, actually, up until William's death, they carry on pretty much as before. Uh, the Geld tax carries on very much like it had done. Um, although Edward the Confessor had not overused the Geld tax, uh, previous Danish and Anglo-Saxon kings had levied he heavy Geld taxes, and William definitely continues in this tradi tradition. And William agreed... Um, that towns could keep their kind of traditional rights and privileges. So in that respect, we see some continuity. There is obviously change. Um, trade with Scandinavia reduces, um, particularly after the Danish invasions. There's increased trade with Normandy. Um, we've got obviously the creation of castles, which are brand new. The Normans, never, the Anglo-Saxons, sorry, they didn't build castles. They built burrs. These military castles are, are different. They're smaller. They're strategic. Uh, Land Frank, as I've said, cannot be underestimated for his influence. Um, really in modernising the church, but also in creating a power base for the Normans in England. Um, the feudal system, again, such an incredibly important change, meant everybody was dependent on the king and on the favour of their lord for power. And that meant that everybody basically was answerable to the king for their behaviour. And when there were rebellions, those people lost power and they were replaced by people who were loyal. Um, and then politically, the Anglo-Saxons were removed from almost all positions of influence. There were a few, like Bishop Wolfston, that remain, um, but only because they proved, they proved to be exceptionally loyal to William. So there are kind of key continuity and change aspects. If you had a question, either a described question or uh, a 12-mark question about why uh, life changed in England, or, or if you even had a 16-mark question, I suppose, about um, which change was most important, maybe religion or Lanfranc's reforms. Um, then or military or, or so the feudal system, this would be a great slide to kind of draw your notes from um, in planning an answer. So we move on to William's death and disputed succession. I have done a separate video walking through all of these steps, but a very brief reminder. Um, actually, the, the main tensions begin way back in 1077 with the prank. Uh, William Rufus and Henry pour water over Robert's head um, it's part of a practical joke. The Normans loved stuff like that. Um, and William has to break it up. This leads to Robert sort of fleeing the, the royal court um, and, and setting out on his own, basically to attack William in Normandy. Now, Matilda doesn't necessarily help the situation by funding Robert, um, but it, it comes to a head in 1079 during this battle where William and Robert fight each other. Uh, Robert actually gains the upper hand and knocks William off his horse. Um, but then saves his life. And this this is something that William cannot bear. As we get to 1080, Matilda organises a reconciliation, but William never fully gives back everything. He never says Robert's going to inherit his entire kingdom, but instead splits it. Uh, William Rufus will take England and Robert will get Normandy. Um, and Henry, he gets money, so don't worry about him. Um, in 1087 then, um, William dies. Um, a mortal wound, he lays dying for a long, long time from July to September. And on the 9th of September, he finally dies. And again, there's this chaos. And we see this as a kind of theme 
Um, so we saw chaos when Edward the Confessor died. We see chaos again uh, when Harold Gobinson dies and then chaos when William dies. And actually when William Rufus uh, eventually dies in 1100, there's chaos again. And it's a kind of theme of these disputed successions. Um, William Rufus is crowned King of England. And what's really important is that Lam Frank is absolutely instrumental in this. Um, he doesn't consult the Witan. They don't make a decision. It really spends, spells the end of the power of the Witan. Lam Frank as Archbishop of Canterbury, chooses and appoints the next king. Um, and that's pretty much been the case right up to the present day. Um, and then we get to 1088, which is Odo's Rebellion. So Odo has been let out of prison. He was in prison for taking some of uh, William's knights without William's permission. He was becoming a bit of a liability, so William's got rid of him. But he lets him out of prison before he dies. And then Odo decides it would be much, much better if Robert was in power. Robert's weak. Um, he's easy to push around. And Odo is much more likely to get what he wants um, from Robert. And he thinks it also makes sense for Normandy and England to have the same king. Um, unfortunately, there, there isn't as much support for this rebellion as, as Odo might like. Um, you've got Odo and Robert of Mortain. Uh, Robert Curthose, the Duke of Normandy, is is sort of up for it, but he isn't up for it enough to actually come and save Odo when Odo finds himself um, besieged at Rochester Castle. In fact, he just leaves Odo there. There are about another seven or so Norman barons, including uh, Bishop William of St. Calais. Um, but they're no match for William Rufus, the entire English population, the majority of Norman barons, and all of the English bishops with the exception of William of St. Calais. So this is why Odo's rebellion ultimately fails. Um, Odo thinks it would be great to unify the kingdom and that Robert would be easier to push around. But the reality is the majority of people side with William Rufus. Um, and that's why Odo's rebellion in 1088 comes to nothing. Right. Thank you for what's been quite a long whistle stop tour of Anglo-Saxon England. Hope you found it useful. And uh, if you've got any questions, let me know. <laughs>